Hi everyone. I'm gonna wait for our people to log on. Let's see. Okay. I'll wait. Uh, hi, Leah. How are you? Um, I forgot. Uh, how are you, Juan? Uh, yeah, I'll wait a couple of minutes for other people to. Uh, hi, Lisa. How are you? To log on, got some cool stories for you guys. Um, about this crazy, crazy experience we've had in the last couple of days of moving. Uh, you know, moving supposed to be, uh, it's never fun. We moved uh, many times in our life, offices, houses, apartments, and so on. So it's never fun. But this was a uh, one special experience, let me tell you. Uh, so, uh, I'm tired, so I, uh, I don't think I'll be able to answer so many questions today, but I'll tell you guys a story. We'll start, uh, literally in a minute, and, uh, get going. Uh, let me see. Did I bring any waters? No. Okay, no water. Okay. Uh, so, as some of you that follow the Shurim know, um... We uh, we moved recently. We just literally the last couple of days we've been planning on moving, and um, to a different community. Tried to uh, go to a different community. In so many words, there's many reasons of why we moved. But uh, anyway, um, Bo Hashem, we found a community uh, also in Florida, and uh, decided this is uh, worth a shot. So um, we set up the move. We looked up uh, some moving companies and uh, decided uh, this one company looked reputable. I'm not going to mention their name yet, uh, just to see, give them an opportunity to uh, rectify themselves as much as possible before destroying their business. Uh, because the story that you're about to hear, uh, even a, a, someone with a vivid imagination, I don't think you'll make something like this up. So, uh, anyway... This company, a few, we uh, called a few companies, and uh, we had a few of them give us estimates. Anyway, this one particular company um, sent somebody to the house to look up everything, look up the price, and uh, give us an estimate. And uh, we liked it because we figured there's, you know, with moving, there's always games. Just so you know, there's always games. It's always, you know... Uh, some added cost last minute. It's never what they say it is originally. You agree to, I don't know, a thousand. Somehow it ends up being two thousand or fifteen hundred. You agree to two thousand. Somehow it ends up being three thousand or four thousand. It's always more. It's never ever the price agreed upon. But we figured, okay, this company came and they're gonna check everything. And there were more money than the other companies we looked at. But they gave us something that we've never seen before. They gave us a price guarantee. So now they came to the house, they looked at everything that was in the house, I also work out of the house, so I have my office in the house, uh, my uh, wife and kids, and you know, uh, one of uh, Team Hashem members that works with me full time, Sunny, is also there with us, and uh, anyway, this, this woman came to the house, I couldn't see her because my wife told me that she was, she forgot to put her clothes on, so uh, anyway, uh, we... Uh, I minded my business somewhere else and let her do what she needed to do as far as her job to evaluate how many, sorry, I have to put the charger in, phone's dying, uh, evaluate how many boxes we have and so on and so forth. So, 
they did it at the end of the meeting this woman uh, gave a price of uh, $1,540 and uh, but since we wanted to move before the Chag uh, she said it's an extra $360 uh, to uh, do it on Sunday so uh, okay originally we were supposed to move a couple of weeks ago but the storm delayed everything long story short to try to cut things short long story short we're going to move this Sunday this past Sunday a couple of days ago so uh, we agreed that it's gonna be nineteen hundred dollars and she gave us a price guarantee price guarantee means price guarantee you know exactly what we have you wrote down what we have it's I'm not gonna double check what you wrote what you didn't wrote it's not my business you you came there with your own eyes for a purpose uh, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. So anyway, writes down everything, and uh, we give her deposit. And then uh, a few days before the actual move, they charge the rest of the money to the card. So meaning, fully paid nineteen hundred dollars before they even lifted a box, before they lifted a penny, before they lifted anything, which is actually not normal. Usually, you're supposed to get paid after you do a job, especially in moving, but. No problem. You want the money, take the money. No big deal. Just do the job, for heaven's sake. Uh, so, so anyway, on Sunday, 8 o'clock in the morning, they're supposed to show up. They show up a little bit late. No big deal. Three, three guys show up. Uh, and uh, whatever. You know, I don't, uh, I don't judge a book by its cover, but uh, they don't exactly look like... Uh, you know, a, um, you know, I don't know, a congressman or anything, you know, they, whatever, three regular looking guys, blue collar guys, and uh, I asked them if they want coffee, it's very important for a Jew to be very kind to whoever, whatever guest they have, because it's Kiddush Hashem, regardless of whether it's a plumber, or it's a mover, or it's a, whatever, whoever it is, it's always very important to be cordial, you know, not treat people like they're slaves or something, chas so anyway, I asked them if they want coffee. They said, yes, I made the three guys coffee. I asked them if they want water, eat, whatever. Just do whatever. Start off the day on the right foot. Problem is, sometimes when you are kind to people or you're nice to people, they take your kindness as foolishness. They mistake you being kind to you being an idiot. And apparently this is what happened. So this is when the game began. Uh, or at least when it started taking the next shift. Anyway, shortly later, they had their coffee, they had their day, they wasted about an hour and a half doing nothing, and then they finally started uh, picking up some boxes. And uh, within literally an hour of working, which is nothing, the guy comes to me and he tells me, no, this is going to be a two-day job. I said, no, 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 two-day job. I'm paying extra money, $360. I'm paying extra 20% for you to do it today. And why would it be a two-day job? He says to me, well, you know, it's a, it's a big job. I said, it's a big job? What big job? What are you talking about? It's a tiny little house. Very modest, Baruch Hashem. We don't uh, have that much stuff. I moved, uh, when I moved from New York to Florida, it was four times the amount of stuff, and it still took one day. What are you talking about? A uh, two-day job. It's a tiny little place. What's, what do I have? And everything, most of it is packed already. Oh, no, I don't know. This is a lot more stuff than what she wrote. Uh, you know, the, I'm like, oh, that's the point of the past price guarantee you guys said you're gonna send somebody here you send somebody here she evaluated what she wrote on the paper is not my business no but it's more than what she said I said hey I don't know what she said all I know is the house and me stayed the same my wife was here my kids were here little one was still six months seventh month old the bigger one was two years old still nothing changed with them within you know a couple of days the boxes were the same the home office was the same the beds with it nothing changed yeah, yeah, but she made a mistake. I said, oh, mistake is on her, her problem. It's not my, it's my problem now. You want to pay for a mistake? No, you don't understand. It's, it's, it's a, I'm like, oh, just, just continue the job. So anyway, conversation started already getting a little rough from the beginning. But uh, you have to know that in general, the, I'm not really sure if it's just necessarily just the non-Jews or it's just everyone that doesn't have Yirat Shemaim. Usually when people see someone that's religious, 
uh, they usually assume that they're naive, weak, and uh, just an outright fool. Now, you need to know that you're not allowed to be a fool. You're not allowed to be a fool. You could be forgiving. You could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone that's nice. You could be someone that's gracious. You could, you know, be calm and collected and so on. But to be a fool, there's no mitzvah in being a fool. There's no mitzvah. You don't get, like, extra gan eden for being a fool. And actually it says, When you go to war, you, uh, when someone is coming to battle, you re- get ready to go to war. You have to use weapons. You can't just, uh, be, oh, no, no, you guys uh, want two days, do two days. You want to do three days, do three days. You want to take a year, take a year. Just please help me and make yourself like some type of little victim. There's no, there's no mitzvah being a victim. But already I saw this guy's playing games. So I speak to him in his language. And uh, anyway, he didn't exactly like this. But they went and continued working. They would take a break every so often. Long story short, I see the guys intentionally delaying things, intentionally dragging things on, skipping some boxes. And uh, whatever, man, do whatever he wants. It's his job. I don't really care. As long as you finish the job, it doesn't make a difference to me whether you finish it at 1 in the afternoon or 1 a.m. Just finish. You got the money already. Whatever. So uh, at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, which is still early in the day, and uh, he says to me, listen, it's, it's, more, than, uh, it's more than what, uh, what she wrote. Again, the same story that we had earlier that day. And I said, listen, what she wrote is what she wrote. I don't know. What do you want me to double check or what she wrote? Our homework? What am I, a teacher? Well, it's not my problem what she wrote. She's your employee. It's not my employee. No, but it's more boxes. She wrote 85 boxes. It's double that. We need more. Meaning, in essence, he wants double the money. Not happening. Not happening. You know, maybe you are looking for suckers. You didn't come to the right place. I'm sorry. It's a, uh, with all, uh, uh, with all uh, due respect to your scandal over here, wrong address. I'm not going to be blackmailed. Why? 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 Because I have a keep on? Because you have my stuff in your truck? Why? So he didn't like that. So he decided to stop working. After you already loaded 75% of the truck. There's still some stuff in the house. He loaded. And he goes outside and he pretends to be on the phone with somebody. And he stopped working. Half hour passes. An hour passes. I go outside. You know, What's going on? Are you doing something? You're not doing anything? This guy is uh, wasting time, burning time, having a drink, calling, da ha ha, laughing, nothing, just wasting time. He could have finished the rest of the job. Anyway, two hours he's wasting, and uh, I go outside, you know, again, we get into a little argument, uh, you know, about this guy wasting time. I said, you could have already finished the job. We don't want you to, you know, let's go and stop, stop playing this game. I'm not playing a game, and I'm not even, he tells me, this guy is double my size. He's double my size. He's a big guy. Probably, I don't know, younger than I am. At least 10 years younger than I am or I don't know, whatever. No, he's definitely not older than me. Much better shape. I don't think he had 10 years of, uh, of uh, medical uh, problems. Uh, and he tells me the funniest thing in the world. He's like, I don't feel safe next to you. <laughs> I said, you don't feel safe next to me. You and you have two other giants that work next to you. Um, uh, you don't feel safe next to me. Why don't you feel next to the safe next to me? I don't know. You said that uh, you know if we don't uh, you know you, you, the way you're talking, and uh, you said that if we don't finish the job, you're not going to get paid. I said, yeah, I already paid you the money, and if you're not going to get the job, I'm not going to pay you. Well, what's the problem? He goes, well, I can't work like that. I'm like, well, well, you don't have to worry. You already got the money. You already took the money out of the account. So even me saying you're not going to get paid, you know, you already got the money. The two thousand dollars already in your account. So don't pretend like you didn't get the money, and you're not going to get the money. So we go back and forth, whatever. Three fifteen, he comes, uh, knocks on the door. I'm still, you know, inside. Two hours of wasted for no reason. He comes inside with a smirk on. It's like, all right, listen, we're going to go to the next house, which is about. 30 minutes away, uh, we're going to drop off everything and come back. And I said, whoa, 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 why don't you take the rest of the stuff? There's still room in the truck. 
Let's uh, finish the rest of the stuff. Get this thing done. Why are you wasting time? And he's like, no, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna finish now. We're gonna finish now. And uh, the home office is gonna call you. The uh, the uh, manager or whatever, the woman that did the estimate, she's gonna call you. Okay, she's gonna call me. No problem. He left with the uh, two other giants. And we figured, you know what? I don't know what this guy is planning. A couple of uh, students came to help me. Two tzaddikim uh, came to help me. And uh, I said, you know what, guys? Let's fill, you know, let's fill up our cars and take as much as we can in case this guy doesn't want to come back and finish the rest. At least we're going to get the most we possibly can. Let's just get this stuff done. Why, why waste time? So the two tzaddikim loaded up their car, loaded up my car, loaded up my wife's car. Uh, surprisingly, this tiny little car that she has uh, from 1994 fit as much stuff as the bigger cars, but oh, watch that little engine that could. So anyway, we fit, got everybody packed up, babies packed up, wife packed up, two students packed up, everybody's packed up, we're on. We drive, again, this is about 40 minutes after these guys left, meaning they should already be unloading the stuff in the new house. We get to the new house, they're nowhere to be found. Gone. Nothing. No people. I start calling. No one answers. Call, call. Within about five minutes, you know, I wasn't exactly born yesterday. Within five minutes, I realized they're not coming. I call, I call, I call, I call, I call. No one picks up. Maybe about two hours later, somebody finally picks up that uh, wicked, wicked woman that came to my house, which apparently is behind the whole scam, uh, picks up the uh, phone and said, okay, uh... I'm uh, your own Reuven. Uh, you know, you guys were moving my house before you guys, before your employees decided to become criminals and steal my stuff. She goes, yeah, yeah, I know exactly who you are. I'm like, okay, well, where's my stuff? She goes, oh, it's somewhere. I said, well, are you going to deliver it? She goes, no, you're going to have to, uh, uh, the owner is going to call you tomorrow and uh, figure something out. Meaning, if I'm not paying more money, then I give him my stuff. This, by the way, it's called blackmail. It's illegal. But apparently I didn't know that uh, people do this on a regular basis with no fear whatsoever. Uh, so I said, well, you need, I need my stuff. I have two little kids. You know, they're, uh, if it was just me, whatever, I'll sleep on the floor, I'll get a motel, whatever, who cares? But I have two little babies. I got my wife. Are you serious right now? No, no, you should have you worried about that before you let the driver leave. Like I made him leave. Like it's my fault that he just robbed my entire house. In front of me, in an open daylight, it's my fault that he left and telling me that he's gonna go to the next house and he lied to me. It's my fault. You see how this is how criminal minds work, where they always blame the other person. It's always everybody else's fault. It's always because of this and because of that and because I didn't have a father and because I didn't have a mother and because I'm blue and I'm black and I'm green and I'm Chinese and I'm this and I'm poor. And I'm rich, and they draw all the excuses in the world. Everything except it's my fault. Except you know everything except it's you know taking responsibility, taking ownership for our stupidity. Ivelet Adam tesalef darko ve'al Adonai is afli bold. Shlomo Amelach says the foolishness, the stupidity of man, is going to lead him to sin. Stupidity, his own stupidity, is going to lead him to sin against who? Against God. So he's going to say, he's sinning against me, he's sinning against God. So his own stupidity will lead him to sin against the only one that he should be, care about in the world, against God. And instead of saying, I'm sorry, what does he say? He gets mad at God for punishing him. This is us, this is people. We make sins against God. And then we get mad that God punishes us. He gives us hurricanes, lose money, problems, da, 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 all this stuff. This is, this is, this is man. So anyway, we have an agreement, signed, guarantee, everything wonderful, all meaningless. At this moment, everything goes to the garbage. They just robbed my entire house, and they want more money, and they won't even tell me how much. They insinuated double, meaning another couple of thousand dollars, but they didn't even say a price. But bottom line is, doesn't matter how many times I call and who I call and what I call, I'm not getting my stuff. Sleep on the floor. Um, so that's, in essence, the situation that they left us with. Baruch Hashem, Hashem had mercy on us, and He sent us wonderful students. So a few of my students that live in the area, oh, about 20 minutes away, 
came to the house, were already helping the Rabbanit uh, clean the house, and uh, were courteous enough to invite us to, uh, to, to their house. So we went to the house, and we stayed over there, and Mamash, it felt like uh, we are at uh, a five-star hotel. Mamash, amazing, 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 amazing people. Yirat Shemaim, Kedusha, holy house, treated us like uh, royalty, gave us a room. It was just amazing to me that it, Hashem just fixed everything that way. And, uh, you know, the next morning, the Rabbanit, Sadika, my wife Sadika, she also knows a lot of Torah. And she says to me, she goes, you know, I had a chidush. She, has, she gets chidushim, the chidushim she gets, million bucks each one. Million, million bucks each one. She says, I had a chidush. I said, what's the chidush, honey? She says, you know, Yosef Tzadik, Yosef Tzadik, when his brothers sold him, his brothers sold him, and, uh, you know, Hashem, obviously, this is all his plan, but he had to sell, they, they had to sell, they had to sell Yosef Tzadik, so he can go uh, to jail, suffer some kaparat avonot, some repentance for sins, fix the neshama a little bit, get even better, but eventually to become the king of Egypt. Why? So he could save his whole family when they come later on and there's famine and there's no food everywhere else. So, but this whole thing, this whole story, this is in Genesis, we're going to read it the next couple of months as we start the, the Torah all over again, each Pasha Shavua. But in this amazing story, you're going to find out something truly extraordinary. It says... That when they sold him, the, they expected the typical, typical traveling salesmen of that day were people that were selling uh, tar products. Tar products and oil, which is very smelly, very disgusting. But that's usually the people that would buy slaves and buy people and so on. But just so happened in this story is that Rashi explains in the, it says in the Torah, that the actual ones that ended up buying Yosef at Sadiq were perfume salesmen. Perfume. The exact opposite. Beautiful smelling. And here, Chazal explains to us that this was Chesed Hashem. This was Chesed from Hashem. This was kindness from Hashem. Where despite the test that he's giving Yosef at Sadiq at this stage, he still wants Yosef at Sadiq to know, Son, I'm with you. I'm with you. So... While you're traveling from where they sold you all the way to Egypt, I don't want you to suffer on, on top of being sold, on top of being abandoned by your family. I don't want you to suffer on top of it smelling bad smell, because bad smell, by the way, you should know, is bad for the soul. It hurts the neshama. That's why you're not allowed to learn Torah or do any prayers in any place that has bad smell. So Hashem says, I don't want my son, on top of the suffering he already has from being sold by his brothers, being abandoned, and the heat, and everything else, on top of that, to hurt his neshama, I don't want that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to send, for the first time in history, perfume salesmen that are going to buy him, so at least he can enjoy the ride and not suffer additional. So the Rabbanit tells me, she, sees, she says, yeah, okay, so listen, they took all of our stuff. Who cares about this stuff? Think about this. Look at how amazing Hashem is, that even through this test that He's giving us, we have perfume salesmen to enjoy. We have amazing students that have an amazing house that they invited us in with such a warm heart, with such kindness, with such, just a mamash, amazing. And we can just, it's like being at a five-star hotel. So instead of us just, you know, we could have easily been sleeping on the floor in a house that doesn't have furniture. We could have, you know, what if we didn't have any, you know, any money to afford anything? What if we had to be on the street? What if they took the keys? You know, a lot of other things could have happened. But Hashem wanted us to know, my son, my daughter, I'm with you. It's just a test. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. He says, Hashem Yitbar tells you in the Torah, I test you to see if you love me. And the Rabbanit got the chidush first thing in the morning, and she says, look, Shem's testing us, obviously a test. If it wasn't a test, why would he send us to such a nice place? Such wonderful students that will host us with no second thoughts. So that was already amazing to me. It was amazing to me that she was able to see that, and uh, it really got me, like, I mean, Baruch Hashem, I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, 
connect this material, uh, you know, for a long time already. But this took it to another level. So anyway, as the story continues, I uh, call the guy, I, uh, what's it called, I um, get a call from the guy. And this uh, happy-go-lucky guy named Billy calls me. Hey, Mr. Reuven, how are you? Yeah, hey, listen. I said, well, I'm not so fine. And uh, ah, yeah, he starts laughing. He thinks it's cute. He thinks it's cute. So I don't think it's cute. Despite the fact that I see Chesed Hashem, despite the fact that I see miracles 24 hours a day, and there's no problem, and I don't miss the stuff. But you also, again, like I said, you can't just let people walk all over you. That by itself is a Chilul Hashem. You can't be just like some turtle for people to kick or something like that. You have to, you have to understand. You have to protect yourself. There's no mitzvah of being a fool. So, one of the things we learn from Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Avinu, is that when he goes and he meets Rachel, before he goes and uh, meets Lavan Rasha, uh, Rachel warns him. He says, I want to marry you. Yaakov says to Rachel, I want to marry you. He says, yes, but my father, Lavan, is a Rasha. He's a Rasha. He's a wicked person. And he's the biggest, aside from being the biggest gangster, aside from being a Rasha, aside from being all these bad things, he's the biggest con man in history. And he's going to con you. And he's going to fool you. And what does Yaakov Avinu say? What does Yaakov Avinu say? You see in the Pirush, you see in the actual scripture. He says, if he's a Khan, I'll con him. I'll be the father of all Khans. Meaning, just like David HaMelech says, hundreds of centuries later, meaning when there's battle, go to war. Meaning, there's a, there's an, there's a language for war. There's a behavior for war. You can't say, oh, you want to fight? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hold a little sword, and you hold the sword, and let's see. Ready? No. When there's war, there's war. Somebody robs your house, you're at war. Somebody's invading your privacy, you're at war. Somebody's doing something wrong, you're at war. You can't just, oh, oh wow, oh, oh, you want more money? Okay, sure, how much? 2000 Sure, here you go, 2000 Or oh, more? 10000 Okay, you want me to go make a chesed fund, go collect money so we can make you rich? Is that enough? Like, why? Don't let people walk over you. There's no mitzvah for that. There's no mitzvah. Especially if it's some zevel shalalam, idol worshiper. What, what, what are you doing? Why are you letting a guy walk all over you? He wants to be a ramai. He wants to be a liar. I'll be a bigger liar. I'll fool him. So, at that point, I realized that I'm at war. These guys are making a joke out of the whole thing. These guys are making a joke out of the whole thing. So, I start talking to them, their language. No verses from the Torah. And uh, I tell him, listen, you want to play games? Play games. You pick the wrong guy. What you can do is you can do a few things. You can bring it to my house now. Or you can keep it and burn it. And burn with it if you want. Whichever happens first. Whichever happens first. Don't make a difference to me. Keep it. Give it to me. But just don't continue wasting my time. And he didn't like it. And uh, he said, no, no, listen, we're going to send it. I don't know when, I don't know why, I don't know this, I don't know that. Oh, song and dance, I don't have time for games. Anyway, he said, listen, we're going to get to you by uh, 2 o'clock. Okay, 2 o'clock. Not an hour passes by. All of a sudden, there's another excuse. No, listen, it's more stuff, and it's this, and it's that. I don't think it's going to be today. I don't think it's this. He said, listen, I already called... I already filed a report. I already uh, called the FBI. I already know the license plate. We already know where the truck is. These excuses that you have are telling me, oh, the guy tells me really, really uh, garbage of all garbage excuses. He says, listen, Mr. Ruben, I, I'm having uh, just as bad of a day as you did yesterday. I have two flat tires. I'm like, wow, just as bad of a day. My kids didn't have a bed to sleep on, and you have two flat tires. Wow, psh. What an amazing comparison. What an amazing... These people, they're playing with people's lives. If I didn't have a student that uh, would, uh, would host us, a dear friend, part of Team Hashem, someone... If I didn't have other people that cared about us, if I didn't have any place to be, this guy would, didn't care in the world if I would just be in the street. So anyway, I told him, listen, you do what you want with this information. FBI knows, the 
cops know. We already know the license plate. We know the story that you're telling me is complete hogwash. The car that has all the stuff is still there. It doesn't have a flat tire. And I hang up the phone. Five seconds later, some other guy that supposedly the owner calls, all of a sudden everything is nice. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The sorry is worth exactly exactly two cents to me. I said, listen, enough with the games. Like I said to your other guy, one of two things could happen. You bring my stuff today or you could burn it with yourself. Whichever happens first. You guys are playing with people's lives. This is not, uh, this is not the way uh, uh, you know, I conduct myself. And again, this might seem like very aggressive language for a rabbi. You shouldn't talk like this, rabbi. Like I said to you guys earlier, Yaakov Avinu, he's not telling us, go talk like a gangster to people. Uh, he's not saying that. But when you're at war, you can't talk to people in a nice, civilized way. Oh, you guys have flat tires? Oh, can I help? Do you want me to come change your truck's tire? Should I pay you more? Should I pay somebody to try? Should I call AA for you guys? Maybe I, maybe I could, maybe they could, like you can't, you have to talk to people in their language. Why? Because if they're already walking all over you and you continue acting like nothing, everything is okay, they'll just continue taking advantage of you. And the next thing you know, they're not going to give you your stuff. They're going to take advantage of more and more. And this is how disasters go from bad to worse. So you have to tell them, listen, you want the stuff? Keep the stuff. You don't want the stuff? Don't keep the stuff. But stop with the games. No games. What, what's these games for? You're playing with people's lives. Long story short, I told him, listen, if you're trying to play a game to get more money from me, there's a 0% chance of you getting anything. I'm not paying you a dollar. Um, in fact, you're not even getting the money that you took. And I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm, you're not going to pay it. Uh, and so on and so forth. All of a sudden, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we'll give you a discount, we'll give you this, that, whatever. When are you going to give my stuff back? Long story short, a day later, we finally get the stuff late at night. I'm, you know, half asleep. Uh, I don't really check anything. They just got some of the stuff. There's still some stuff in the old house. We go back to sleep to, at, the, uh, at our friend's house again. And uh, again, she was amazing. And Moash treated us like royalty. It was really, feel at home, felt no different. And again, you see the blessing from Hashem that despite the difficult circumstances, you don't feel it really. What are you missing? Some stuff? Big deal, some stuff. So the next morning, the Rabbani teaches me another thing. He says, so we have another chidush. <laughs> I said, your chidushim, each one's worth a million bucks. got to hear this one. And she says, I never realized how little someone actually needs to survive. Because we don't have anything from the stuff. We just had a little suitcase that we always take with us. A little bit of clothes for the kids. A change of clothes for us. That's it. Nothing. Nothing. My little tiny little travel suitcase for the whole family. Most of it is bottles and food for the kids. That's it. And he says, you know, I never realized how little you actually, a person actually needs. Like all this stuff we carry, it's just stuff for nothing. And this made me think, you know, on the way home, uh, we're driving and I started, you know, I look at the neighborhood and I started looking at everything and I'm like, you know what? Every house looks the same. Like in every neighborhood, all the houses look the same. It doesn't matter where you go. Whether you're in Panama or in America, in New York, in L.A., in Florida, wherever you are, each neighborhood has, you know, all the houses look the same. Seam developer usually built a bunch of houses. They all look the same. It's all like boxes. It's all just boxes. Boxes after box after box after box after box. And people spend their fortunes to get this box. They get this box and it's just like... It's like everything to them. And they make sure that even though on the outside, all of these boxes look exactly the same, inside it's got its own unique things. And they spend everything they have to make sure the inside is amazing. And it's this. And it has their personal touch. And they decorate it. And they buy this. And they buy that. And they buy this. And they do this. And they decorate. And they fix. And they break. And they fix. And they invest all of their time to fix this box. So one day... Whenever that day may happen, when someone comes to visit to see their box, a.k.a. home, you say, oh, wow, what a nice box. What a nice home you have. But in reality, that never happens. In reality, what actually happens is more likely to be one of two things. Either they come to the house and they see it's actually a nice house and they say, 
wow. Why didn't God give me something like this? They don't say it to you. But jealousy starts eating their heart when they see you have better stuff than them. Or nicer stuff. And they start giving you aynara. They give you the evil eye. Because they feel like you don't deserve it. They do. You don't deserve the $100,000 car. They do. You don't deserve the million dollar house or the $500,000 house or the whatever house. They do. You don't deserve this table. They do. And they start looking at it. It's like their wow is not a wow of compliment. Wow, good for you. I'm happy for you. Their wow is like, wow, I can't believe God made a mistake. That's what they think. They think God made a mistake that they got. They don't have it, but you do. That's at least 75% of the time. People become jealous when they see your stuff. The other 25%, they don't like it. And what happens when they don't like it? They tell everybody else, ah, look, your own has an ugly house. Steve has an ugly house. This one has an ugly house. They have this, they have this, they have this. And then they, make, they start making fun of your house. You spent your whole life trying to fix this house to be your little unique box. That, you know, it's your own personal space. You spent all your money, all your energy, all your everything to have your own little spot. And this little miserable comes to your house and he's either giving you Aynara or is making fun of it. It's like rare to ever find a decent human being that comes to your house and is actually happy for you. Very rare. But I started seeing, I'm like, you know what? People spend their whole lives trying to fix this thing, this box that they have, this house they have. For what? To impress other people? It's never going to happen. We end up worrying so much about what other people think that we forget about us. We forget about our own neshamot. We forget about what's really, really important in life. And, and the purpose of life being our relationship with our Creator, our Father in Heaven. We worry about what people think. Flesh and blood that's eventually going to be eaten by maggots. We worry about what they think. We worry about what they have, what they don't have. We forget about who gave us everything. And I started thinking, I'm like, this is what Shlomo Melech was saying in the entire book of Ecclesiastes. You know, my, my wife was telling me, he's like, you know, she met some people in the past where they would actually say, you know what, I don't want to read it because it depresses me because it's a serious reality check and you have to be ready for it because he keeps telling you that all this material stuff is worthless and it's meaningful when it comes from him because he had everything. He had women, he had power, he had money, he had... Pro everything. And he's telling you it's all worthless. The only thing that's valuable is a connection between Hashem and you based on Yirat Shemaim, based on fear of heaven. That's it. Everything else is nonsense. He didn't talk about love Hashem. He didn't talk about a uh, special type of, uh, I don't know, some emunah where you just sit there and everything works. He said if you have a connection with Hashem based on fear, you have a real connection. Once you have that, you have everything. You don't have it, you have nothing. All the money in the world, all the girls, all the guys, all the this, all the that. It's all worthless. It's all nothing. Shlomo Melech, wisest man of all time. She says, it's a serious reality check. People run, people that know, sometimes they don't want to read the book because they're not ready for this reality check. I said, well, he was right. Look at this. I mean, people just spend their entire lives to build these boxes for somebody else to like and they're eventually not going to like it anyway. And they worry so much about that that you, they have to leave behind anyway because you can't take that to Allah Abba. You can't take that to the next world. You can't take it anywhere. You might not even be there for a long time anyway, period. You might have to change jobs, change this, change that. You get this whole investment you made into this house, it's temporary. Why not start investing into your soul? And that's why I started realizing it's like, this is the Chesed Hashem. This is the biggest gift from Hashem Barach to make you realize that Rosh Hashanah is Judgment Day. And the Mishnah tells us that Hashem gave us the Slichot 40 days before Rosh Hashanah, before Judgment Day. Not just for this, you know, let's just see what they do with it. Let's just see what happens, if they like to sing or not. No, it's to prepare us for the day. It's to prepare us for the day because... If someone comes to Rosh Hashanah without any intention to change, 
They're going to Rosh Hashanah. They're going to pray morning to night like the best of them. They're going to pray with full heart. They're going to even cry during the prayer. They're going to pray and pray. They're going to be better than the Chazan. They're going to be better than the Rabbi. They're going to pray that what people are going to talk about this prayer for centuries. But in reality, in reality, the moment Rosh Hashanah is over, they go back to their life, nothing changes. Same angry guy, same immodest woman, same Michalil Shabbat, same eating taref, nothing changes. Still cheap, still doesn't give his wife uh, any, any uh, uh, courteous behavior, any love, any respect, any honor, nothing. Still the same beastly human being. The Mishnah, which came before the Gemara, already ran 2,500 years ago, says, better off he didn't come. Why? Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, not going to help him. Why? Because Rosh Hashanah is only going to help you if you intend to do tshuva. That's why the Pasuk says, Nake lo yinake. It says, Hashem cleanses the, uh, cleanses the sins, and He doesn't cleanse. What do you mean? He cleans or He doesn't cleanse. He forgives or He doesn't forgive. Why? He forgives those on Rosh Hashanah if they do tshuva. They don't do tshuva, might as well don't go. Stay home. Go have a barbecue. I started to realize we spent all this time worrying about the boxes and the boxes and the boxes and to fit in and to look like this way and to look like that way. For what? First of all, we don't need that much stuff. But Hashem loves us so much that He gives us a lot more than what we need. We need what? A shirt, pants. For a woman, you need a dress. Kids need a few change of diapers. You need a meal a day. What do you need really to survive? To survive, what do you really need? You really need this giant house. You really need this fancy car. Do you really need, I don't know, five meals a day, four meals a day? Do you really need it? Do you really need, a, you know, five sets of, uh, you know, outfits that uh, for every day of the week, a different suit? Do you really need it or do you want it? We see Hashem is willing to give you what you want, not what you need, even beyond what you need. He gives you what you want. He gives you multiple suits and multiple cars and even multiple houses and multiple kids and multiple... He gives you a bunch of stuff even beyond what you need because He loves you. You don't need it, but He loves you and He gives it to you. What are you giving back? What are you giving back? Well, you go to the once a year. You gave some tzedakah, you gave $180 once a year, you think you're a big tzaddik? Like, why? What, what, did you give, what are you giving him back? What, I, you can't really give him anything back. He has everything. He's God. So what can we do? At least we can show that we notice, we appreciate. So when we show up on Rosh Hashanah, he's not asking us for prayers. He's not asking if you're a good singer for 40 days and 40 nights on Slichot, or whether you're going to come with the nicest outfit to Rosh Hashanah, or whether you could sing louder than everybody else. Or whether you're the biggest macho guy that donated the most amount of money in public, 10 times high, 10,000 times high, 50 million, 5 million, whatever, all this stuff, this joke that people make out of donations where they do it simply to collect kavod, to let, collect honor so everyone knows they have a lot of money. Like, that's not what Rosh Hashanah is about. It's not what Yom Kippur is about. It's not. It's about doing tshuva, it's about changing. It's about changing us, changing the midot, changing this anger trait, changing the stinginess, changing these bad character traits that make us no different than these criminals that stole my stuff, that Hashem gave us, that we don't need anyway. But if we don't change, we're not different than them. Okay, so they steal from people. We're stealing from God sometimes. They steal from people. They disrespect people. We disrespect God. It's worse. So I see that this is this is why this whole thing is happening. So Shem is teaching me. He's teaching me to lie. I can't study because all this moving, all this stuff is happening. You know, you can't like sit down and open a few books like normal. So Shem says, okay, I'll teach you in a different way. We'll learn to in a different way. I'll send you a couple of criminals. They're going to steal your stuff. Ben, you know, change your whole world around. In one second, you go from having a few things to having nothing. And uh, let's see what you do with it, son. Good luck. And you start learning. 
It's like, oh, look. This is Hashem. It's dark. That's where Hashem is. It's dark. That's where Hashem is. So, I started seeing the Rabbanit is giving me Chidushim and I'm developing them and that's how we work. We're teamwork. And, uh, as Hashem would have it, late that night, they start bringing some stuff back. The next morning, we look at the stuff. We see there's a, you know, a bunch of stuff. Most of the stuff is damaged. And then they've violated uh, our privacy even more by these wicked people urinated on some of the stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, on the kid's crib and uh, whatever. They're just disgusting animals. Animals, you know, animals actually, at least animals... Animals, uh, you know, they, they, they don't have a better choice. They, they're animals. These people walk on too. And they broke our stuff. And you see that some of the stuff is broken intentionally. It's not like accidental moving broken. And obviously you don't urinate on something uh, that belongs to somebody else by accident. You don't urinate. On it. But these are animals. They don't know any better. They're animals. I said, this is Chesed Hashem. This is Hashem explaining to us that all from him. Something good has to happen from here. Something good must happen from all of this experience. All of this experience, it has to be good. And I start realizing that, hey, look at everything that's happening. In the last several years, Baruch Hashem, many, many people have done tshuva to learning Torah with us, and learning the truth about Hashem. And, listen, if it's true, we say it. If it's not true, it's not for us. So, Bo Hashem, this means that we fulfill the mitzvah of using Hashem's Torah as the Book of Wars. That's what Hashem calls it, the Book of Wars. And in uh, the last several years, there's been some big wars. When they had uh, these so-called big rabbis decide that it's a good idea to bring the number one Catholic missionary in the world to speak about what he believes is the purpose of life at a synagogue of a thousand Jewish families. Baruch Hashem, we went to war and Hashem won that war where the event was canceled after two months of sleepless nights and letters and videos and shurim and uh, phone calls and emails and a lot of different things nonstop. And Baruch Hashem, the guy never came. Hashem stopped it. And uh, Baruch Hashem, throughout this whole journey, there's been many other wars. And just the last week, we released three clips of videos, one being about another proof that uh, wigs uh, that are made out of uh, real hair are... Uh, Obviously, uh, not only a form of Avodah Zarah, but now we have a connection to the swastika, which, again, people are going to make up every excuse in the world of why everything's allowed. Eventually, they're going to tell you why Chazir is allowed, pig is allowed, milk and meat is allowed, uh, driving on Shabbat is allowed, uh, killing people is allowed, whatever you want is allowed. Anyone, people are looking for excuses, they'll make an excuse for anything. People are looking for the truth, they say, oh, whoa, I never considered this, I never considered this. But you see, in the, so you see it exactly. exactly. The people that wear wigs and don't want to change, they're not looking to do chupa, they're looking to be the same animal they started, same animal that came to the world, they're going to stay. They go to, 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 to Rosh Hashanah and they're not looking to change. They're just looking to, you know, fill a void. They're just looking to pay their dues. They're just looking to pray like everybody else prays and they go home. Nothing's going to change. They're still going to have a barbecue on Shabbat. They're still going to, you know, uh, be stingy. They're still going to do this. They're still going to be the same person. People are not looking to change. No, I, we can't help people like that. And unfortunately, sometimes those people are in a religious world. And you show me, listen, you know, that wig that you're wearing, I know you keep Shabbat. I know you keep kosher. I know you're trying to be modest. I know you are send your kids to yeshiva. I know everything is good. Hashem. I'm not judge or jury. But I also know that according to our halacha, not for me, not my opinion, the G'dolei Ado, the Gemara, the Zohar, the Shulchan Aruch, the whatever you want, according to Halakha, you're not allowed to enjoy idol worship. And if the wig is connected to idol worship, you're not allowed to use it. And you see it in the religious world. People 
mamash are separating themselves from truth and lies. If they're people of truth, they are shocked. And they start looking for, okay, what do I, what can I do? It's hard for me to take off the wig because I'm used to it and I like it and this and this and this. But I can't, I mean, I'm, I can't go against Hashem every single minute of my life. So they're in a dilemma. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. I know. I know it's hard. It's hard. But they know that it's wrong. So they're already trying to figure something out. Some are taking off the wig. Some are taking off partially. Some are switching to uh, uh, synthetic. They're doing something at least. But they're not faking it. They're not just saying it's not a problem. Then there's the fakers. Then there's the people that are just not looking to change. The people that are just, you know, looking to, you know, no, no, I wear a wig. I'm already doing a shem a favor by wearing it in the first place. In reality, they wear a wig because it looks better than their real hair. That's why they wear a wig. And they don't care whether it's avodah zarah. You can have the guy that just, you know, the woman that just donated the hair come to the person's house and say, hey, listen, I did it as avodah zarah, me'achuz. This is idol worship. I did it as idol worship and I put it on your head. So, okay, thank you. They'll shut off the door and say, no, no, she didn't say that. She didn't mean it. Don't make it an excuse for anybody. Why? Because they're not looking for the truth. They're not looking for the truth. So, those people are going to make up excuses. They're going to make up excuses. No, this rabbi said it's okay. That rabbi said maybe. Maybe you're misunderstanding. Maybe you missed this. There's always there's a million and a half excuses of why they don't want to, you know, they're okay for not changing. This is the same issue that's in Christianity, which is the second battle we started. We made a whole video. We already mentioned things about Christianity for years already. We made a whole shiur fighting Christianity and all nonsense of the um, New Testament, whether it's being preached by Christians, Catholics, or what they call these uh, uh, Messianic Jews, which is another form of Christianity that just calls itself Jewish. For the first time in history, Christians are pretending to be Jews. So it's become... Even more dangerous than ever before. We were, unfortunately, it was easier to identify who's who when they were killing us centuries ago. Now, we don't know. The voice is the voice of Yaakov. It sounds like a Jew. He wears a talit, he wears a kippah. He even calls himself a rabbi. But in reality, he's Esav. Why? He says, pray to J.C. Penny. J.C. Penny this, J.C. Penny that, J.C., J.C., J.C. Which the reality is you could just see that it's idol worship. Even if they say he's only the Mashiach, even those fools that say that J.C. is the Mashiach, they're also idol worshippers. And the reason why is because they don't mean he's the Mashiach. Why? Because even if there, he was the Mashiach, let's say, even if anybody was the Mashiach, Chabad also says that the, the Rebbe that died, Zechat Tzadik Livacha, they say he's the Mashiach. It's not about him being the Mashiach. It's idol worship. Why is it idol worship? Because where in the Torah does it say, where, where in the Torah does it say, you're constantly supposed to mention the Mashiach in your prayers to such an extent where in essence you're, almost, you're practically praying to the Mashiach. You're connecting to God through the Mashiach. You're constantly talking about the Mashiach. It says, remember the Mashiach, think about him, you know, expect him to come. But it doesn't say, pray to the Mashiach, put his pictures on the wall, the Mashiach is this, the Mashiach is that. It doesn't say that anywhere. As a matter of fact, the Rambam said you shouldn't even talk about it much. Why? Because it's not going to help you with Yirat Shemaim. It's not going to help you with Avat Hashem. It's not going to help you with fearing Hashem or loving Hashem. It doesn't matter who the Mashiach is. It, doesn't, it makes no difference who he is. It doesn't say, I mean, the greatest of all is Moshe Rabbeinu. Do you see anywhere in Judaism for, you know, that, that, that someone has a picture of him? That someone says, oh, Moshe Rabbeinu, I, uh, you know, I... Uh, uh, this and that. No, it doesn't say anything. Hashem specifically made sure that no such nonsense would happen to desecrate Moshe Rabbeinu's name. That's why he buried it himself in a place that no one knows. Because he knew that if everyone knew where Moshe Rabbeinu was buried, everybody would start praying to Moshe Rabbeinu instead of to God. So obviously if Hashem didn't want anybody praying to Moshe Rabbeinu, he doesn't want anyone praying to this J.C. Penny idiot that uh, was a big sinner adulterer that died 2,000 years ago. He must be more. Or the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Zechat Tzadik Levacha, who was a big tzaddik, but at the same token, did not want anyone praying to him or constantly mentioning his name 24 hours a day. Doesn't say that. So we fight this stuff. We fight it, even though it's true, no one likes to hear it. And it hurts, and it's a reality check, and this, and that. 
The bottom line is we fight it. So this is this is this wakes up people. During the first day that the lecture came out about Christianity, given all the proofs, literally within hours, within hours of the lecture, one of my students uh, sent me a uh, thing. I showed this to my uh, my uh, friend, who's who's Christian. She said at the end of the lecture. She dropped Christianity on the spot and she wants to figure out what to do with herself, whether she's going to convert to Judaism or become a righteous Noahide. But she knows for sure now Christianity and the whole J.C. Penny is complete garbage. It's toilet paper, like you said, he says. So it's, she says only a blind person would believe that Christianity is it. So you ask yourself, why does anybody believe in Christianity? Why does anybody believe in this so-called Messianic Judaism garbage or this uh, Catholicism? Why? Why? Because simply said, the, this religion, this New Testament, allows people to do nothing, to live without any responsibility. Pretty much all you got to do is just believe some guy died 2,000 years ago and he died for you, for your sins, because you're incapable of doing tshuva and uh, you don't, you know, you don't, you're just a big sinner and you're the worst and everything else. So he died for you to fix your stuff. And as long as you believe that, everything is okay. But you continue murdering, he'll fix it. You continue killing and, and robbing people and, and damaging their personalities and damaging their lives and doing everything else. No problem. As long as you believe some idiot died 2,000 years ago, Everything's okay. Nonsense. But why? So what, I mean, why do they even need to believe in him? Why don't you just believe in nothing? Because believing and going to the church or the messianic synagogue makes you feel religious. Even though you're not doing anything. Even though you're the same person. Nothing changed. You don't work on character traits. You don't work on anything else. If you're a thief, you stay a thief. If you decide that you want to pee on somebody else's stuff, you'll do it in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he'll forgive you and he'll fix it and whatever. But at least it makes you feel religious. This is the biggest joke in history. And the reality is that's why so many people are leaving it. Because anyone that's looking for the truth realizes it's a joke and it has to be something. The creator has to want more from us, expect more from us. We're not incapable. We can do more than just nothing, than just use some guy that died as a crutch to continue doing nothing but feel religious inside. As a matter of fact, you look at Parashat Nitzavim, last week's parasha, Hashem specifically says, Hashem specifically talks to those people. He says, the ones that are religious in their heart, those are going to get an extra punishment. Extra punishment they're going to get. And I'm not going to forgive them. He says this in last week's Pasha. I'm not going to forgive those that are religious in their heart. Why? Make it a joke out of the whole thing. I gave you the heavens. I gave you earth. I gave you the sky. I gave you the planet full of goodness. I gave you Parnassa. I gave you a wife. I gave you a husband. I gave you children. I gave you, you know, good health. I gave you everything you have. And you're telling me you're religious in your heart? You're not going to do anything for it. You're not going to pray like you're supposed to every day. You're not going to give tzedakah because everything is yours, you think. You're not going to work on your character traits and still act like, a, you know, like an animal. You're not going to do anything about it. You're just going to stay the same. Nothing. It's a joke. He says, the ones, the Shemit Barach says, the ones that are religious in their heart, I'm going to punish them extra. I'm not going to forgive them. If they die like that, I'm not going to forgive them. So whether Jew or Gentile, you have to know, Hoshana is a reminder, there's no religious in your heart. See, the, being religious, meaning being connected to Hashem, is based on doing. You have to do stuff. What do you do? You have to read the instruction set. It's called the Torah. What does the Torah say you have to do on Hoshana? What does the Torah say you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis? What does the Torah say you have to do on a year-to-year -year basis? And so on and so forth. There's an instruction set. The Creator knows you need instructions. You need to know what to do. So He gave it to you. But to just say, no, no, I'm just going to figure it out on my own. I'm going to figure it out on the go. I'm just going to wing it. How come you don't wing it on a million dollar deal? How come you don't wing it on marriage? How come you don't wing it if you're smart? How come you don't wing it on, you know... I got disconnected. 
Uh, we'll connect this to the other one. But anyway, to finalize the point is that everyone has to, every man has tefillin, and then the tefillin has a uh, th- over a thousand alachot, a thousand laws that uh, the people that make the tefillin have to follow. It's over a thousand laws. It's a very detailed job. It takes a while to make a tefillin. Uh, approximately about a year to make a tefillin and um, they have to follow the same halachot that we had in Mount Sinai. Literally, from 3,300 years ago, they have to be black, they have to be square. You're never going to see a pink tefillin unless it's a, know, some reform shul. You know, it's always going to be square, and it's going to be black, and it's going to be a certain type of le- leather from a pure animal. It can't be from just anything, and so on and so forth. It has to follow all these laws. It's very perfect and very precise. And the scripture that's written inside has to be a certain way, a certain pattern, and certain language, and certain letters, and shapes, and forms, and everything. Everything has to be very, very perfect. The tefillin have to be perfect. But then if you notice, on every pair of tefillin, you notice that in the string, which are all hairs, and the tefillin, you'll see that it's all very precise, and they're all going into their holes, and it's very, very tight to keep the tefillin intact. But then at the end, there's like loose strings. A small, a few small loose strings at the end of the tefillin. And it's like almost like having loose strings on like a button-down shirt or a dress or something. Where there's a few loose strings. What do you, what do, you do usually? You take a scissor and you cut it to make it, you know, to perfect it. To remove this extra string that doesn't look good. That makes it imperfect. So before I knew what this meant, I asked my rabbi, I'm like, oh, this my tefillin, I think the guy made a mistake. The rabbi made a mistake where he didn't, everything looks great. It's a beautiful pair of tefillin from Yerushalayim. You know, I got it when uh, we uh, had the book of Torah, the scroll, Torah scroll written over there. The same sofer made me a tefillin. I said, oh, I think he made a mistake with the tefillin because there's an extra string that's sticking out. So I'm thinking about cutting it. Is that Okay. And my rabbi was like, no, no, don't cut it. <laughs> I said, well, okay, fine, why? Why not cut it? He goes, no, that's for the Satan. I said, excuse me? He goes, that's for the Satan. I said, excuse me? He says, everything that's holy, everything that's kadosh, that's holy, is what feeds the Tumah, what feeds the Satan. They nurse they get their power from kedusha they don't get their power from tuma they don't get their power from just sins they get it they nurse their power from kedusha they have to get something and this is just the nature of the world that hashem created i said okay so why are we helping him because because if we don't all hell will break loose meaning it gets worse so now in everything that you're going to do that's special You need to give him something to get him off your back to some extent. It's like a bribe, if you will. This is in the Zohar, very, very mystical stuff. But nonetheless, he says, in a tefillin, we leave those extra strings. It's in a a way to get him off our back, to leave us alone while we're doing tefillin, while we're laying tefillin. It's imperfect. So this imperfection is what he wants. So while we're laying tefillin, he doesn't bother us. So we have a direct client to Hashem Yitbah, a conversation with Hashem Yitbah, it doesn't bother us. Every time you do something big, that's kadosh, that's holy, whether it be wars against Christianity, wars against anti-Semitism, wars against the things that are against God in general, or you're going to finish a masechet in the Gemara, or you're going to give tzedakah, or you're going to do something big, something holy, something that Hashem wants you to do, the bigger it is, the more likely you are to get the Satan's attention. So sometimes you're going to see a lot of interference. And it stops all of a sudden. Because that's usually when the Satan got his. So we saw that there's an enormous amount of good that's been happening in a very, very short period of time. Of course, we've been doing good for a long time already, a few years. But in the last week, it's been... a an abundance, Baruch Hashem, an abundance. A lot of people doing tshuva in the last week. A lot of people, amazing stories in the last week. More than usual, Satan had to get his. 
I said, okay, you're doing all this stuff, I'm going to wreck your move. I'm going to make that moving truck become the moving truck from hell. Get these three animals to become the drivers of the moving truck. They're going to steal your stuff. They're going to break it on purpose. They're going to urinate on it. They're going to ruin it. And let's see what you do then. Well, Satan, Satan, Yig'al Becha Hashem. Hashem will fight you. Why? And he's going to beat you. Why? We're not giving up. We have Hashem on our side. We have Hashem on our side. We know this too is a test. This too is for the good. This too is for the good. All of it is for the good. This is the biggest part of the test. When Hashem gives you a test, He's asking you, are you going to leave me? Or are you going to tell me you love me? And that, my friends, is what Hashem wants to know on Rosh Hashanah. He wants to know, are you going to leave me? Or are you going to tell me you love me? If you're going to leave me, you're just like everybody else. Just like everybody else that's ungrateful. Just like everybody else that takes and doesn't say thank you. Just like everybody else that pretends like they don't need to do anything. They don't need to do mitzvot. They don't need to learn. They don't need to do anything. They can just do whatever they want. You know, the live and let live type of mentality. They give some stakah once or twice a year and make themselves feel like they're great. They uh, do a few prayers and make believe as if they're fantastic. When they want to give stakah, they make it like it's a whole scene. They want to let everyone know they just gave $50 or $50,000 or fifty whatever they gave. They want everyone to know that this is happening. It's an event. That's not the God. That's marketing. Or if they uh, pray, they went to Bikneset. They want everyone to know, I went to Bikneset today at 6 a.m. Okay. What, you want a cookie? This is not mitzvot. This is advertising. It says, Hashem says, that's not loving me. That's, that's not loving me. Loving me means you're doing it just because. You're doing it without expecting anything in return. You're going to get everything, something in return. You're going to get Olam Abba, But you're not doing it because of that. You're doing it Leshma. You're doing it because, just because. Because you love me. So when I send you a test, you're going to stick to that. You're going to stick to that love because you're going to remember, I didn't do the will of Hashem because He gave me money. I didn't do the will of Hashem because he gave me a husband or a wife or kids or this or that. I didn't do the will of Hashem because he gave me good. I did the will of Hashem just because. Just because I love him. That's it. That's it. That's loving Hashem. When was the last time you did something for Hashem just because? Not because you wanted a reward. Not because you wanted Olam Abba. Not because you want everybody to know you're the big tzaddik or tzaddikah. Oh, and look, I changed my clothing. I'm very modest now. Oh, look, I gave extra money. Oh, look, I'm now giving 20. No, no, no. No, look, nothing. When was the last time you just learned Torah just for the sake of learning Torah? When was the last time you just did the will of Hashem just because? That's it. Just because. You didn't stop. For any reason. The Satan came and knocked on your door and fired you up and broke your chair and broke this and broke that and disturbed you. And there was noise and there was craziness and there was no money and you didn't stop. Why? Because you wanted to do the will of Hashem. Why? No reason. You just wanted to do it. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. When was the last time you did something like that? Ever? Did we ever do anything ever in our life? One time in our life. One time in our life. Not every day, one time in our life, purely because it's the right thing to do for Hashem. Did we ever do such a thing? That's what we have to think about in Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is not for people to show up, make some prayers, make some noises, donate some money, and go back and be the same person. Go back and be the same Michal Shabbat. Go back and be the same you know, guy that doesn't change. Go, that, that's not, that, Rosh Hashanah will not help such a person. There's a Mishnah written about them. It says, it's worthless. They might as well not come. If you're not planning on changing, you're making a joke out of it. As a matter of fact, the Ramban, the Ramban, Allah wa Shalom, says when someone says vidui, vidui is chatan, or avin, or pashan, when he says I, we sinned, not on purpose, on purpose, intention, and so on and so forth. And he says all different types of sin. This is a way of repenting. He says when someone does this vidui, 
But he doesn't actually mean what he says. He doesn't actually mean that he's sorry to Hashem. He doesn't mean it. It's like a chadai, he's just reading the prayer, just reading the words. Just reading it. It's no big deal to him. It's like, yeah, chadai, no, abinu, pasha. He makes noises. It's like, like a little kid makes, you know, all these little strange, you know, weird noises just because it's fun for them to make these noises. Same person. He just makes noises in Hebrew words or English words or Russian words or whatever words. He makes noises. He knows, but he doesn't actually, there's no meaning behind the words. Nothing. The Ramban HaKadosh says, those words will act as a kitug, will act as the prosecutor against him in Shemaim, as how much of a joke he's making of God. How much of a joke? Why? You're saying Chatanu, but you don't mean it. You're saying Avinu, but you don't mean it. You're saying Pashanu, but you don't mean it. Why are you saying it then? So not only you're reminding God of something he already knows, which is that you sinned, but you're reminding him that you don't really care. Why? Why bother, Bichlal? Why bother? This is obviously not a message for people that are looking for an excuse out to not go to Bikneset. This is a video for people that is to help people connect to the source, to connect to the truth. You're looking for excuses? You don't need to come here. You need to go somewhere else. You don't need to go anywhere. You can find enough excuses on your own. But you're looking for the truth. You're looking for what Hashem wants. This is what Hashem wants. Hashem wants you to be sincere. To be sincere. Do it just because it's the right thing to do. Because He's giving you above and beyond what you need. He's giving you above and beyond what you even want. The least you could say is show some gratitude. That's what Rosh Hashanah is about. What gratitude, what does Hashem consider gratitude? Tshuva. Repent. Stop sinning. Try to stop sinning. Work hard on it. This is the whole purpose of Rosh Hashanah. When Rosh Hashanah comes, that's what, that's what Hashem is waiting for. He's waiting to see when you're praying, when you're making the noises, when you're pretending to cry, when you're pretending to care, when you're pretending to be such a righteous person. Everybody pretends to be Moshe Rabbeinu and Saimin all the time. When you're pretending, while you're pretending, is there any part of you that's sincere, that really is doing tshuva, that really believes that they sinned and they really don't plan on sinning again? Is there any part of you that's real? Any part, not the whole thing, any part of you that really means it? Or are you just pretending to pray better than everybody else? That's what Hashem is looking for. He's looking, are you, are you at least here when you're talking to me? Talking to God, talking to God with me. Are you going to lie to my face too or is just lying to everybody else? That's what Hashem is looking for. He's looking to see who is here to do tshuva. He sent us prophet after prophet after prophet for generations to find the diamonds in the rough. The prophets didn't succeed in making the entire nation do tshuva. But that never stopped them from trying. They tried to get everybody to do tshuva. They got it wherever they could. That's the job of Kiruv speakers, to get Ami Salat to do tshuva. But with all this stuff, with all this, you know, people that are just looking for excuses, time's up. Rosh Hashanah is here. You can't show up to Beknesset and think that it's a get out of jail free card because you showed up. Like you're doing anyone a favor. Or like you donated some money. Like you're doing anyone a favor. Or you made some prayers. Like you're doing anyone a favor. The whole point of Rosh Hashanah is it's time to do tshuva. It's time to admit I've sinned. I'm sorry. I will do my absolute best to improve. I'll become more modest, whether male or female. I'll become more generous, whether male or female. I'll become more righteous, whether male or female. I'll learn more Torah, whether male or more female. I will, do, I, will, I will do better. How? I will do it. How? I have to look at the instruction set and start learning. What do I need to improve on? But I will do better. I'll do better. Do better. That's what, that's what Rosh Hashanah is about. It's not about the food. It's not about going to Beknesset and seeing all your friends you haven't seen all year. It's not about that. So sometimes Hashem says, you know what, you did a good job this year. 
But there's a few things, there's a few things that weren't so good in the past or even this year. So I want to get you, by the time you get to say this, I'm sorry part that I'm going to do better, I want you to already have a good case for you. So I'm going to give you some kapat avonot. I'm going to give you some extra suffering right before the end of the year to clean you up. So you look even better when you get in front of me. It cleans you up. Those sins that you made in the past, whether this year or in previous years, they need to be cleaned up. It's two choices. They need to be cleaned up in this world or in the next world. I want it to be cleaned right now, so you show up at Roshana. I want you to be clean. So he gives you extra kapat avonot. He sends movers to you that look like a legitimate company, but end up being thieves. They steal your stuff. They violate it. They do all these different things that are awful. And it's a big test. But we don't understand how much that this test itself is the biggest chesed of all. It's the biggest chesed of all. And I'll finish off with a story. The Vilna Gaon, I love Shalom. He knew secret parts of the Torah, mystical parts. And one time he told, he writes in his book, told his students about the details of what happens to a person after they die. Who comes to see them, the angels, what happens if they're good, what happens if they're bad. And he says there's several things that are hidden for men. The Kamala says several things that are hidden for men. What are hidden for men? It's one of them is the Omek Adin. Omek Adin means like the depth of the judgment. And Shemaim, of what the actual judgment is, what a Shem actually looks at. And the Vilna Gaon explained this to the people, to his students, and he says that there's actually an angel that is responsible to monitor every single second of your life. And he's going to use every second wasted, every second, we're not talking about every minute or every hour or every year or every month, well, every second wasted, he's going to use it as a case against you. This is what the Vilna Gaon was saying. Every second, to such an extent, even swallowing spit, it's considered a waste of time. This is beyond any person in this generation at least. So one of the students of the Vilna Gaon understood what the Rav was saying and passed out. He got shocked and passed out. Completely passed out, lost consciousness. They woke him up, threw some water on him, passed out again, water on him. Eventually he woke up. They came to the Rav, they came to the Vilna Gaon and said, Kvod Rav, you, you scared him to death. I mean, the guy passed out. The Vilna Gaon says, Why? He says, everything you said. What's so, I'm not sorry, this is the truth. It's what it says, it's what Hashem says, what do you want me to do? Everything I said is the truth. So now, the, even the people that helped this guy get out of his unconsciousness are about to pass out. He goes, oh, actually, wait a minute, I forgot to tell you one thing. So everyone's eager to hear what this thing is. And the Vilna Gon says, I forgot to tell you how valuable suffering in this world is when it comes to judgment in that world. The amount of value that they give for any little bit of suffering, any major suffering that you have in this world, is so significant in Shemaim that if we knew it, if we truly knew it, we would actually pray for suffering. That's how valuable it is. So you see, sometimes Hashem wants to give you a gift. He says, you know, I really want to give you a good judgment on Rosh Hashanah. I really want to give you a good judgment in Shemaim. But you made a few things, a few things that are not so good at some point. Use an improper word. You improper uh, behavior. Da, 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 a million and a half things you can do wrong every day, every second. But I really, you did a lot of good, enough good that I want to give you good. So, but I have to fix these few sins. So I'm going to give you some suffering. Why? That way when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, you're clean. You're clean. You show up. There's no mekatreg. There's no prosecutor against you. Why? You already got his. The Satan already got his. You came up, clean slate. I could say, psh, not only innocent, reward. So that's the biggest chesed. 
So yes, they stole the stuff, and they tried blackmailing us, and they eventually got the stuff to us, but it was damaged, and it was uh, violated, and it was this, and it was that. But in reality, look at how much chesed Hashem gave us. Look at how much, just, let's just count, just a few things I can remember. First of all, look at amazing students we have that invited us into their home. I mean, Mamash, it was like uh, amazing. Just invited us into our home. We felt like it was a five-star hotel. Amazing people. Made us feel like so comfortable. Just to know that there's somebody in the world that cares about you, other than your own parents, your own family. You know, someone cares enough about you that is actually eager to help. You know, sometimes people help, but it's not necessarily because they want to. So someone eager to help. That already gives you good. Then you have the Rabbi Nitz Chidush. The next morning she says, Look, Yosef at Tzaddik. Then you have the other Chidush about Yaakov Avinu. Then you start seeing that Emunah and Hashem, especially during tough times, that's the test. Then you start realizing, Hey, look, this is actually cleaning me up before Rosh Hashanah. Then you start realizing, Hey, you have to be serious. This is Rosh Hashanah. So many different things. So many different gifts from Hashem It Barach. It looks bad. But look how good it really is. Hashem loves each and every single one of you. He wants to give each and every single one of you an amazing judgment. But all of us need to do something about it. We need to show up with something. We need to show up with something. If you're going to go pray, don't just pray to make noise. Pray with real serious intentions to change. Change your behavior. Change your modesty. Change your overall connection to Hashem Barach. Change. Improve. It's time to improve. It's time to become a better version of you. If you want to do something big to help other people do it, all the work that we do, it's all free. Obviously, people pay for it. You want to donate? The best time to donate is right before Rosh Hashanah. Why? Because Rosh Hashanah is also a time that Hashem decides who's going to live and who's going to die. And it says, Tzedakah Tzim Mimavit. Tzedakah will save a person's life. Could save a person's life. So if there was ever a time to donate, to donate to a major cause, to donate to save souls. Just like you want Hashem to save your soul, you want to, help, you want to show Hashem that it's worth it to save your soul. Why? Because you're contributing to saving other souls. So instead of donating five, ten, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to the Bet Knesset that could get it from a bunch of other people looking for kavod, you could donate the same amount of money and you could save thousands of souls. Thousands, not one, two. Thousands of souls. Same thing. The difference is you won't get as much kavod in this world for donating for Kiruv as you do in the Bet Knesset. So if you're looking for, for kavod, this is not it. You're looking for a major mitzvah to help Am Yisrael, to help Hashem's children come back to Hashem? This is it. That's one thing you can do before Rosh Hashanah. Last but not least, last but not least, get ready for a major year. A lot of extraordinary things are going to happen in this, in this year. A lot of things. A lot of good things. A lot of major things. You've got to get ready for it. You've got to make sure you're doing everything possible to prepare yourself spiritually. Forget financially. Spiritually, not materially, spiritually. Connection to Hashem now. Don't wait until Mashiach comes. Don't wait until somebody's sick. Don't wait until somebody's broke. Don't wait until somebody's about to get married to a non-Jew. Don't wait until it, there's damage. Now. Prepare now. A lot of big things are going to happen. Bezat Hashem, we all have a Shana Tova, Shana Metuka. Learn from wonderful, wonderful experiences like this where even though somebody decides they could have the right to pee on your stuff, you still see Hashem Barach doing you a favor. Shana Tova, Shana Metuka. Love you all. Bezat Hashem. We'll talk soon. Kotuf.